In the chemistry of carbon, there are literally millions of possible reactions. So in this lesson, we're going to examine how we can possibly narrow that large number of reactions down into a few steps that make it more understandable. It turns out that a lot of the secret to this lies in recognizing nucleophiles and electrophiles and the sorts of reactions that they can undergo as well. So our learning goals is, are there any general patterns in organic reactions? And what are they, if there are? And what is the role of nucleophiles and electrophiles in chemistry? So to start off with, let's talk about nucleophiles and electrophiles, just to remind you what they are and uh, what roles they play. So a nucleophile, which literally means nucleus-loving, is an electron-rich center on a molecule or ion that has a non-bonding pair of electrons. So in some sense, you can think of this as being like a base. So uh, if we think of ammonia as a base, ammonia is a great nucleophile because there is a non-bonding pair of electrons on the nitrogen, and that non-bonding pair it represents an electron-rich center that can then undergo nucleophile-type interactions with other species. An electrophile, which means electron-loving, is basically an electron-poor center of a species. So it's a positive area in terms of the molecular elect electrostatic potential. It's a positive area in the molecule. And we often associate these things with acids. So you can see already the, the, the acid-base chemistry that uh, is implicit in a lot of what we talk about. So there are several organic mechanistic steps that we're going to be talking about in this lesson. They include nucleophilic attack, loss of a leaving group, rearrangement, and finally proton transfer. And I think uh, from all of these names you can get a little bit of a feeling for what they might be about. Now if you want, and I'm not asking you to memorize them, but you can remember these different organic reaction types by the following mnemonic. If you just think of the letters from L to R, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, every other letter uh, in some sense represents the first letter of one of these reaction types. So L for loss of a leaving group, N for nucleophilic attack, P for proton transfer, and R for rearrangement. So now you can impress your friends and uh, uh, make uh, a lot of uh, hay, if you will, at a party by showing them that you know all these reaction types and can do them by memory. Let's start with nucleophilic attack. As you might expect, this is, involves a nucleophile that attacks or donates its electrons to another species. Now the key point of a nucleophilic attack is the formation of a new bond, and typically that new bond is a carbon-carbon, a carbon-nitrogen, or a carbon-oxygen bond. All right, now it's shown diagrammatically here where we show a nucleophile, and I've written that fancifully as uh, N with a subscript U to stand for nucleophile, um, and that nucleophile has a pair of non-bonding electrons attached to it that can then be extended to attack or donate themselves to an electron deficient center on another molecule. And that's drawn uh, in the molecule next to it, where the carbon atom is drawn as a pos partial positive charge and the L as a partial negative charge. So the result of this nucleophilic attack is going to be to form a new bond between the nucleophile and that carbon atom. Now, a subsidiary effect of this particular version of a nucleophilic attack is that the carbon also loses that, uh, that uh, atom L. So the L, uh, not too uh, secretly, is standing for leaving group, perhaps. But notice also that the L takes its electrons with it. The electrons for the new bond between the nucleophile and carbon come from the nucleophile. So in order to maintain a neutral charge on the carbon, that L is going to leave the carbon and take the electrons with it. Now here's an example of a nucleophilic attack. Um, this is water reacting with acetyl chloride. Okay, acetyl chloride is the molecule on the right, and the carbonyl group is known to be one with a very polar carbon-oxygen bond, so there's a partial positive charge on the carbon and a partial negative charge on the oxygen. And the non-bonding electrons on water are, are, are on an electron-rich center, so that electron-rich center is a nucleophile, and it can attack the carbon atom in this carbonyl bond. 
And the net effect of that is going to be to create uh, this very exotic looking species uh, to the right where we have uh, in effect something that looks like a hydronium ion. It's got H2O, but the O also has a bond to a carbon atom. That's the new bond that's formed. And uh, the other effect of this is to take the double bond between the carbon and the oxygen and move those electrons over up to the oxygen so that it now has three non-bonding pairs on it and a negative charge. So there's a lot going on in this, but the net effect of all of this has been to create a new carbon-oxygen bond, and that's why we would term this a nucleophilic attack. You should note that good nucleophiles tend to be stronger bases. They are often nitrogen or oxygen. They can be anions as well. You know, we're looking for things that can hold a negative charge or can be an electron-rich center and also have non-bonding electrons on them. Let's move on to loss of leaving groups. The net effect of this is to essentially to lose something that's attached to a carbon, so it's going to be the breaking of a bond to carbon. This is the clue that you will look for in order to determine if something is this particular reaction step. So this might be a decomposition reaction. So what's shown here as an example is a, a random uh, hydrocarbon or uh, organic molecule carbon which is attached to uh, something called X which we'll assume is the leaving group. And the net effect of this step is that the electrons that are holding the X and the carbon together are basically promoted up to the X and it leaves behind an a cation that has got a positive charge on the carbon and the X leaves as a negatively charged ion. So again, we see that the bond that's formed between carbon and X are, contains the electrons that stay with X when it leaves the carbon. And uh, this carbocation, this is the first time we've seen this in, in either of our courses, uh, but it turns out that this is an interesting species that uh, one could spend quite a while, I guess, cataloging its various properties. We'll talk about it a little bit more in uh, one of the remaining steps as well. All right, so this is a, another common type of organic reaction step. You should note that good leaving groups tend to be weaker bases, so you would think of them as the conjugate bases of strong acids. So in this case, that X could be a chloride ion. Chlorine atom, I should say, and the, and the X minus is a chloride ion. Uh, it also would be anything that's a poor nucleophile can be a good leaving group. All right, there's a vast uh, exotic array of things that can serve as good leaving groups, and uh, a full of course in organic chemistry would teach you what they are, but I think for now it's simply to know that it's not a good nucleophile, that it tends to be the conjugate base of a strong acid uh, will help you identify them. All right, so what about that carbocation? Well, there is something called a carbocation rearrangement, and that represents one of the other organic reaction steps. And the net result of this is the movement of a hydride or an alkyl group within that carbocation species. Okay, that, I've used a lot of jargon there. A hydride is basically a negatively charged hydrogen ion, so H minus would be a hydride ion. So what will happen in this is that the H, uh, an H that's attached to the carbon, will move along with its bonding electrons to another carbon. In fact, what it'll do is move to the carbon that is carrying the positive charge in the carbocation. Uh, this can also happen with a, with a carbon group, that it will move with its electrons over to the positive carbon, but it's probably a little bit more common for the hydrogen to do this. Now, there's a lot that can happen with this, and, and obviously it's hard to anticipate all of the things that can happen. But there's a general hierarchy uh, that says that the most stable carbocation is called a tertiary carbocation. It's the one at the far right of this chain, and it's one where you've got three different uh, alkyl groups attached to the carbon that has the positive charge. So uh, it, it would be like, a, you know, we, we talked about primary, secondary, and tertiary alcohols, so this would be uh, basically the tertiary alcohol without the OH. All right, now the next most uh, stable carbocation would be a secondary carbocation. So it's one where you have two alkyl groups attached to the carbon with the positive charge. And you can see that it goes down so that the least stable of these would be simply a positively charged carbon with three hydrogens attached. And in fact, this is 
uh, extremely unstable. It reacts in a flash. It does not hang around very much. It's very difficult to stabilize under any sort of experimental conditions. So we're mostly going to be thinking about the upper ones, especially the secondary and tertiary carbocations, and uh, the sorts of rearrangements that they can make. Now with this scheme of stability among the carbocations, we can represent that energetically, if you will. And this is not meant to be a reaction diagram. I'm simply trying to uh, demonstrate sort of the relative stability of these different kinds of cations. All right, but it helps us to predict when it's possible for a rearrangement to happen. So it's basically saying that a one degree carbocation can convert itself by through a, a rearrangement into a two degree carbocation or a two degree can convert itself into a three degree or tertiary carbocation, but it's not likely to move the other direction because that means adding energy and moving to a less stable place energetically on this curve. So what does this look like in terms of real molecules? This I hope will help to clarify what's going on. So here I have a one degree carbocation drawn on the left hand side and the red arrow indicates the possible movement of a hydride over from the left carbon to the right carbon. Now notice what happens when it does that. When it moves over, it's going to move its electrons with it, so now it forms a new carbon-hydrogen bond, and that carbon no longer has a positive charge, but it's left behind a vacancy on the carbon that it was originally attached to, and so now that carbon has a positive charge. Um, you know, so in a sense what's happening is the positive charge in the hydrogen atom are switching locations. The hydrogen atom's moving to the new carbon and as a result the, the plus charge is ending up on a different carbon. Now we'll notice here that uh, what has happened is we've converted a one degree carbocation, a primary carbocation, into a tertiary carbocation. Now why is that one on the right, a tertiary carbocation. Well, look at that carbon that has the plus charge. It's attached to two alkyl groups, uh, undescribed, R and R prime, and it's attached to a methyl group. So it has three carbons attached to it, and that makes it a tertiary carbocation. So this would be a very favorable rearrangement because we've just traded in a relatively unstable primary carbocation for a tertiary carbocation and gone far down in energy to do that. Another car organic reaction step is a proton transfer, and I think after studying acids and bases, this one should be pretty easy to understand. It's essentially the relocation of an H plus between two chemical species, so it's a single displacement sort of step. Now, the way we want to represent this in, is in terms of where the electrons go, and in this sense, it does require a nucleophile of some kind, but that nucleophile now is functioning as a base. So that nucleophile comes up to a molecule that has a hydrogen attached, um, and that molecule then serves that, that HA serves the function of being uh, an acid in this case, and the H is now forming a bond with those pair of uh, non-bonding electrons on the nucleophile. It forms a bond to the nucleophile, and it releases the conjugate base to that acid, A minus. All right, so this is uh, very much like the acid-base reactions that we saw in module five. Um, I want to caution you, though, that since it does involve a nucleophile, in this case the nucleophile is serving the function of a base, you should be careful not to confuse this with a nucleophilic attack. A nucleophilic attack almost always results in the formation of a new bond between a carbon and a carbon, a carbon and an oxygen, or a carbon and a nitrogen. In this case, the new bond that we're making is between some, uh, you know, some element, probably nitrogen or oxygen, with hydrogen. So hydrogen is part of the new bond, and so uh, that's what helps you recognize that this is a proton transfer and not a nucleophilic attack. Now I want to spend uh, a brief time, since we've touched on acids and bases, to uh, fill in something that we didn't talk about in the catalyst lesson, and that is acid catalysis and base catalysis. Now in the case of acid catalysis, the initial step is always a reactant that's being protonated by the acidic environment, so it is a proton transfer. So here we have uh, in this example a case of an amine where the nitrogen on the amine is a nucleophile. It has a non-bonding pair of electrons and it has a rich, so it's a rich center of electrons. So it might see a hydronium ion in solution 
and it would form now a new bond between that non-bonding pair on the on the nitrogen to uh, the acidic proton on the on the hydronium ion. This forms uh, what we call an alkyl ammonium ion. So it's not an um, amine anymore. Uh, it's an N that has four bonds and a plus charge. And then what can happen as a subsequent step in this is that the, the R group can detach itself uh, from the amine by basically releasing the amine, the protonated amine or the ammonium ion. Um, it can release that as a leaving group. So what you have here is a two-step process in acid catalysis where you've basically gone from starting with an amine and by putting it in an acid environment, you end up with a carbocation um, for the group that was attached to the amine. All right, so this is the way in which the acid can catalyze the change that happens in that initial amine. This can also happen with an alcohol, as shown here, and once again, it's the oxygen that is serving the function of a base or a nucleophile in the first step of this process. It uses its non, one of its non-bonding pairs of electrons to create a new bond to a hydrogen ion that's uh, part of a hydronium ion. It will then form what is known as an alkyl hydronium ion. So that's an R group that's attached to essentially a water molecule, but there's a positive charge on the oxygen because it has three bonds. Once again, that can form a very good leaving group, and in essence what we have from this is a carbocation that's formed from this, um, but it's been, initiated by, uh, it's been initiated by a nucleophilic attack that has grabbed a, a, a hydrogen from an acid, so it's initiated by a proton transfer. Now we can similarly get some initiation that comes from base catalysis, but of course that's going to be different. Instead of adding an acid, we will be adding a base, and so what's likely to happen is it will create a proton transfer when the base grabs a proton from the molecule that we're interested in modifying. So in this particular case, the B is the base that we've added, HA is the molecule that we want to um, participate in some reaction, so the first step is that B comes in, the base appropriates a proton from A, it leaves the conjugate base A minus, and now that can participate in more reactions. So here's an example in the case of an alcohol. An alcohol is not a very strong base, uh, or sorry, not a very strong acid, um, but if you put it in with a bunch of hydroxide ions, so say maybe say you mix ethanol in a water solution with sodium hydroxide, well, those hydroxide ions are very strong bases. They can ap appropriate a proton from the alcohol, and that leaves an alkoxide ion, the RO minus. That alkoxide ion now can undergo subsequent chemistry with something else, uh, because now that alkoxide ion is a very good nucleophile. It's got a, three pairs of non-bonding electrons on the oxygen. It's got a negative charge, so it's electron rich. It's got non-bonding electrons. It's ready to undergo some sort of nucleophilic attack somewhere else. So this is a way in which the base can catalyze the subsequent reactions of this initial alcohol and cause it to undergo other chemistry later on. Now, just to get a little bit of practice, I want you to consider the following steps that actually occur uh, in you know, one particular kind of reaction. So in the first step, we've got, uh, we've got an alcohol. Okay, it's a, a butyl alcohol, a secondary butyl alcohol, and it's put in with HBr, and the net result of the reaction is for us to have a hydronium ion, an alkyl hydronium ion, and bromine minus. So what kind of reaction is this? What has actually happened in this? Well, the net effect, and this is how I want you to begin thinking of these things. Look at the net effect. And the net effect is that we have moved a hydrogen over from the bromine. The bromine is now all alone. It used to have a hydrogen attached. Okay, but we didn't just move a hydrogen atom. We moved a hydrogen ion. We moved a proton. Okay, whenever we've moved a proton like this, this is a proton transfer, so that's how we would label this particular kind of step. Now let's say we've got that alkyl hydronium ion and it's just hanging out there in solution, but uh, at some time later we come by and we see, oh, whoa, what happened? We've got water and now we've got a carbocation. So what happened there? What kind of step was that? Well, the only thing that happened in this step, and this is, again, what I want you to be able to recognize, 
is that we broke a bond. We broke a bond between the oxygen atom and a carbon atom, okay, from the initial molecule on the left uh, to what shows up in the products. So anytime we just break a bond, that's the loss of a leaving group. And that's how we can characterize this. Okay, what about the third reaction? <clears throat> what is the net effect of what's going on here? Well, we haven't, at least we haven't broken any obvious bonds, but remember there are hydrogens attached to all of these carbons in here. And so they're kind of a hidden factor that we can't see. But what we can see is that the plus charge, the positive charge, started off on one of the remote atoms, so it would be a primary carbocation. And after the process is done, it's now located on the middle carbon, which is a tertiary carbon carbocation. So that's clearly a carbocation rearrangement. We have moved the positive charge from one carbon to another. And even though it's difficult to see the hydride shift that made this occur, we can assume that that's what's happened. Um, and indeed, the, the car carbon atom that originally had the positive charge is the one that picks up the hydride from the central atom. Okay, in the last step, we've got uh, that carbocation and bromine, uh, bromide ions that are reacting. And at the end of the process, we basically have formed uh, T-butyl bromide. Okay, so what's happened here? Well, the net effect of this process has been to create a new bond between the carbon atom, the central carbon atom, on the carbocation and the bromine, and the bromine. So anytime we've created a new heavy, heavy, heavy atom, heavy atom bond, that typically spells a nucleophilic attack. So the nucleophile in this case was the bromide ion, and it's attacked the electron deficient center on the carbocation. So I hope something like this helps you to recognize these different sorts of reaction types. And you may want to play this slide again and, and try yourself to see if you can reason for yourself as to what kind of or organic reaction type we've seen in each case. So as a summary, a nucleophilic attack is the formation of a new bond to a carbon on a reactant. Okay, And we just saw that in the last reaction on the previous slide. The loss of a leaving group is the dissociation of a bond between carbon and another atom. So if you see that, that's probably the reaction step you've seen. Proton transfer typically is a nucleophilic attack on a hydrogen atom, and it forms a new uh, bond between hydrogen and another atom. Okay, Typically an oxygen or a nitrogen, though it could be something else as well. And finally, a carbocation rearrangement simply places the positive charge on a different carbon atom. So if you see those clues, you should be able to identify these reaction steps. So I hope you've seen that there are indeed some general patterns in organic chemical reactions, and that this really depends heavily on the role of nucleophiles and electrophiles in these molecules. Thank you.